Pete Sorensen is an attorney in Eugene, Oregon, specializing in the Freedom of Information Act, otherwise known as FOIA. With 30 years as an attorney, lawyer, and advocate, he's licensed to practice law in the District of Columbia and the state of Oregon. He helps journalists, authors, nonprofits, for profit businesses, and others to access federal government records. He assists clients with FOIA requests, administrative appeals, judicial reviews, and FOIA litigation. In addition, he also speaks and lectures on FOIA, most recently at the Appalachian Public Interest Environmental Law Conference in Tennessee, the University of Georgia School of Law, and at the University of Tennessee College of Law. For Pete Sorensen, public and civic service is a cornerstone. With earlier careers working for a member of Congress and as special assistant to the Secretary of Agriculture, he's currently serving his 24th year as an elected commissioner on the Lane County Board of Commissioners in Eugene, Oregon, and prior to that, he served in the Oregon State Senate. Mr. Sorensen's political and civic experience adds a depth and understanding to his FOIA work that is unique among lawyers. Please feel free to contact Pete Sorensen at Pete Sorensen, it's S-O-R-E-N-S-O-N, at gmail.com, and his website is www.foia-lawyer.com. His cell phone number is 541-606-9173. And it's the Sorensen Law Office in Eugene, Oregon. Hello, this is Pete Sorensen. I'm a Freedom of Information Act attorney, and the title of this presentation is The Freedom of Information Act, What Every Lawyer Should Know. And this is being presented to the Center for Continuing Education. Our goals here are to help attorneys in all fields of practice to learn how to successfully navigate the Freedom of Information Act process, which I'll call the FOIA process, to better support um, their clients. I'm going to go over the background and purpose of FOIA, the steps and phases of the FOIA process, some practical tips to increase the success of your client's FOIA requests, and issues involving the Freedom of Information Act's provisions on attorney fee shift awards. Just to uh, introduce myself and give a little background, I'm Pete Sorensen. I uh, represent clients primarily in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. We'll get into that uh, as why I do it there in the course of this presentation. I'm 68 years of age and I've been practicing law since 1982. Uh, I'm licensed both in the District of Columbia and in Oregon. I've worked in Washington, D.C., both as a legislative assistant to a United States representative and as a special assistant to the Secretary of Agriculture. In the course of my legal career, I've spent 15 years representing nonprofit organizations in cases involving the Safe Drinking Water Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and Endangered Species Act. I've also uh, represented victims of environmental torts. Uh, in addition to my federal service, I've served as a state senator in Oregon State Legislature and therefore been heavily involved in political and government process at the federal, state, and local levels. The Freedom of Information Act is a federal law that requires federal agencies to provide records when any person makes a written request for those records. FOIA also provides that the United States District Court for the District of Columbia has jurisdiction and venue over all judicial reviews of FOIA matters. No other district court in the federal system has the breadth, authority, and expertise to handle FOIA matters. I'll add that uh, if you are a 
if your client is a resident of a, a district other than the D.C. district, you can bring a FOIA case where your client resides or where the records reside or in the District of Columbia. So I, I bring these cases in the D.C. district in part because it has jurisdiction uh, by the by the specific language of FOIA to handle any FOIA case in the country. FOIA is the nation's premier open government accountability and transparency law. The law was enacted in 1966 and reluctantly signed into law by President Johnson. When he signed the law, he wrote on the bottom, no ceremony, meaning that he was approving the law, but he didn't want to have a ceremony uh, <laughs> to show the public that he was signing the law. The real uh, author of the Freedom of Information Act is Representative John Moss, who battled his own uh, political party as well as uh, the opposite political party in uh, working on this legislation for 12 years leading up to its, uh, its approval. Just to give some context to the uh, court where this Freedom of Information Act litigation, roughly 40%, maybe 50% of the nation's FOIA cases are brought in this courthouse. That's the E. Barrett Prettyman United States Courthouse located uh, just off of Pennsylvania Avenue, about a third of the way from the Congress to, to the White House. FOIA has been amended many times in its uh, nearly 50-year history. Uh, most recently, President Obama signed the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016, uh, right before the 50th anniversary of the law. And I'll just mention that FOIA is a law that is supported by uh, both of America's leading political parties. And it, there's a, an interesting pattern whereby uh, when the president is of one party and the Congress is controlled by the other party, uh, then FOIA tends to be amended because the Congress wants the benefits of being able to uh, get more information about what the executive branch is doing. The basics of the Freedom of Information Act is that with certain specific exemptions, nine specific exemptions, which we will get into, all records may be requested by any person. So the any person part is literally any corporation, nonprofit, partnership, individual, foreigner, uh, citizen, voter, non-citizen, Anyone can ask for records, and records includes, and they're defined as documents, reports, emails, photographs, and many other records that may contain information. And that's a really important word there, information, because the word information is in the FOIA itself. But remember, you're not allowed to ask for information. You're only allowed to ask for records and Information may be on records, it may not be on records, but FOIA is not about, despite its name, it's not about getting you information, it's about getting you records. FOIA is a fairly short law, it's found in the United States Code, and uh, here is one page of FOIA. Here's another page, here's another page, here's another page. And keep in mind that the act is actually quite uh, small as it applies to the process of FOIA. One way to find out about FOIA and the fact that it is amended fairly frequently is to look on some uh, fairly easily obtained uh, websites. The two that I use most commonly is the Cornell Law School uh, they have a legal information institute, and they keep track of all of the United States code changes, and uh, that's shown here on our, our slide. Also, the U.S. Department of Justice uh, is, is quite good at updating uh, the Freedom of Information Act itself, so that's another source. Now, the purpose of FOIA has been recounted by the Supreme Court in a number of cases, and uh, I think it's useful to get the basic purpose of FOIA. I think these two cases, the NLRB versus Robert Robbins Tire and Rubber Company, 
case in 1978, the basic purpose of FOIA to ensure an informed citizenry. Uh, the National Archives and Records Administration v. Favish case, more recently, 2004. FOIA is often explained as a means for citizens to know what the government is up to. And so these are the basics of FOIA. It's really to provide records to people who make written requests for them. From the government's perspective, the FOIA process is that they receive an initial request. They acknowledge the request, usually by letter or email, and then they ask you as the requester to perfect or make your request more clear, or they ask you to explain your request, perhaps to narrow the scope of your request, and then they conduct a, a search for the record records that you've asked for. Then they decide to process those records by subjecting the records that they found against a background of the nine statutory exemptions. And if some of those are uh, subject to the exemption, then they don't release those and they release the other records to the requester. So that's from the government perspective, how they view it in most agencies. Now, from the uh, requester standpoint, uh, the request process begins with the requester, your client, writing a request. First and foremost, there must be a writing for that request. You write your request the way you want to write it. There are typically no forms to fill out, and the requirement of FOIA is that it must be sent to a specific federal agency that you believe has your records. So uh, if you make a request to multiple agencies, you should make a specific request separate and distinct to each federal agency that you're seeking records from. By the way, records can be sent, uh, the request can be sent by personal delivery, U.S. mail, U.S. mail with return receipt requested, email, or through a government uh, portal website if they have that. Keep in mind that your written request is not valid until it is received by the government and your client, as the potential plaintiff in a FOIA contested case, either doing the administrative procedure uh, process or the judicial review, you must prove that the federal agency received your request. Um, by making the request, keep in mind that you want to state that you were willing to pay the applicable fees, I recommend up to $25, unless you're asking for a fee waiver and unless that's been granted. Uh, I typically will ask in my request that if the estimate to process it exceeds $25, that they obtain my written consent before they uh, charge me more money. Incidentally, under the statute, uh, you can request an expedited process, but most of the cases under that are pretty clear that it's only when a life or death situation is at issue. In the Benzman case, uh, this is Benzman versus National Park Service, a 2011 district court case in DC. Keep in mind that the uh, courts are very clear that you must first submit the formal request, and after the individual submits the request, then the agency must determine with 20, within 20 working days, and that's about a month in real life, after the receipt of request, whether to comply with such request. Now, keep in mind that the fees can be waived if they violate the 20 days, which they often will do. I'd say in the vast majority of cases, they have violated the 20 days. Um, by the way, the agency can get an extension if they show unusual circumstances. And I find that agencies rarely ask for that, but they can ask for it. A practice tip for you in submitting requests is uh, usually I submit them by email 
or certified mail with return receipt requested. The benefit of the email is obviously it's faster, and if I think I'm gonna get a positive answer back that they received it, then uh, I might cut uh, two or three weeks off this process by simply sending the email. I've done that with a number of agencies that I have worked with that have responsive uh, Freedom of Information Act officers, but there are some that do not provide that kind of service, and you will then want to do the certified mail. A great example is, and one of the agencies that gets the most requests is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and they don't do anything by email. They send a uh, I send a certified letter, they send me back a letter saying they received, they received it. And keep in mind, it's when they received it is, that's the key. And you have the burden throughout the entire process to show that they received it and they received it on a specific day. Now, advocates, uh, in my view, and this is a practice tip, they need to be um, they need to be asking for records as soon as possible. Keep in mind that every one of us uh, in the entire world is entitled to make as many FOIA requests as we want. And so you often will want to counsel your clients to think about uh, how many ways you can ask for the different types of records you want. Uh, you can also ask for regional offices as opposed to national offices. Uh, I've got a couple of examples there where I say some agencies are quite uh, regional, like the Department of Transportation. Uh, they have their 10 regions around the country and they keep most of their records at the regional level. Uh, for local projects and, and regional projects, but others have more of a national perspective like the FBI and the CIA, and they are uh, almost entirely national and, and they don't really have much records at the local level. Um, keep in mind that the federal law has been amended and a lot of lawyers uh, in, in, in general practice don't know this, but now there is what is called the estimated completion date process where you can ask the agency as the delay begins to pile up, you can ask them for an estimating completion date. And that, that can be very valuable if you are going down the route of uh, judicial review and litigation uh, to establish that not only did you make a written request, but you've also made uh, uh, several estimated completion date requests, and that also adds to the uh, violations of the statutory scheme of FOIA, which means that if they violate the, the statute and they breach a deadline, then uh, you don't have to pay the search fees and copying fees, so uh, that's a real advantage to clients. So I'm gonna be talking now uh, on the practical tips for the written requests. I put this slide up to describe the Environmental Protection Agency and some of the response times for the written requests. Uh, and this graph shows the number of unfulfilled requests that are out there at the EPA. Uh, and so this is showing that, uh, that virtually all of the requests that the EPA received in 2017, that they resolved those within 60 days. Uh, a, a small number were out as far as a year, but the vast majority were actually handled within uh, three months. So keep in mind that most requests are handled in an expeditious fashion. Uh, the ones that people bring to lawyers are usually the ones on the outer edge. Here's another slide showing the response times, and uh, this was the unfulfilled request. Uh, in the case of the Customs and Border Protection Agency, and again, it's pretty much the same uh, pattern that uh, uh, most of these requests are being handled in, uh, in, in an expedited fashion, you know, in, in the slow world of FOIA. 
couple of uh, tips for you and your client to uh, increase your success with uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, one is in your request, make a timeline for the documents you're seeking. If you write the U.S. Treasury or the U.S. Department of Agriculture or agencies that have been around for nearly 200 years, if you don't put a timeline in there, you're basically asking them to search everything uh, all the way back to the creation of the agency. Well, you don't really want that. Usually you want um, records within a five-year period or a 90-day period. Um, sometimes you may want them for longer, but, but you might want to think about putting a time limit on your request. Another way is uh, to just start in with something that can be more easily um, obtained, and that is, say, emails that can be searched electronically. You might want to use the term all emails instead of all records. And that way, if there's references to other types of records in those emails, then you can ask for those. But that way, you might want to uh, narrow it down to the type of record and one that can be easily uh, search. Another idea is that if you or your client uh, are aware of a, a specific report, you can ask for that specific report, and that really narrows it down. I had a client uh, who was um, a company that was looking for a report that was written by the EPA, and it was critical. The, the data in the report was critical of my client's uh, op opponent, my client's competitor. And that was extremely valuable. And they'd heard about this report, but it never been released. And they tried to get it. The client tried to get it uh, from the EPA, and they couldn't get it. And they retained me to ask for it, and uh, I was able to get it. So that's an example where they just had one specific report, maybe a 300-page report that the agency didn't want to give up, but when they got a, let's say, stern, forceful letter from an attorney, uh, they they gave up the report. Now, I mentioned that part of the process with FOIA is you write your request, but then you got to get an acknowledgement of that request. And there's a couple of things that is in that acknowledgement that you're looking for. One is that they tell you when they receive the request. That's really important because if you have a smudged uh, certified mail receipt uh, or it's unclear by the communications they've sent you that they haven't specifically given you a date they received it, then at least you'll have uh, the possibility of the date of their acknowledgement of when they received it. That's really important. Um, the other thing is that they're going to give you a control number, often called a reference number or a tracking number, and that number is a very crucial piece of information practically as as you uh, begin the process of massaging this FOIA request and getting as much out of the agency as you can before they start putting up uh, uh, bureaucratic barriers to, uh, to getting it. Here's a uh, National Security Agency uh, response, and I just wanted to highlight one thing on this slide, and that is your request has been assigned case number 58395. Now that's really important that you use that number every time the, the tracking number, the control number, the case number, the docket number, however the agency refers to that number, that is a crucial piece of information that needs to go on every email and every letter that you send to the agency regarding that request. Uh, once again, I don't want people from a practical standpoint to ever mix up the request. I see this with, say, less sophisticated people. They'll say, hey, I wrote you about uh, control number one, two, three, and uh, once again, just like when I wrote you on control number X, Y, Z, you're, you're not doing what I want. Do not confuse the agency any more than they might already be confused about your request. Keep it simple. Write your emails and your letters and right up front, 
put regarding control number, regarding case number, however the agency describes it. Now, during this next phase, once you've gotten the control number and once you've gotten the request in and now they know what you're asking for, they might ask you clarifying questions. Sometimes they're asking clarifying questions because they can see that it's too broad and would otherwise not even pass muster as a, as a valid FOIA request. Um, other times they're asking because they, they don't want to look for as many records as your request uh, might imply. So uh, they might ask you to clarify, and you need to get back to them right away because in, in the agency's protocol, whenever the ball has been shifted to your court and you're not responding, they consider that request to be timely handled. So every day that goes on that you don't respond to a clarification request is lengthening the time that you're going to get uh, your request deemed perfected. And therefore, until they perfect that request, they're not going to start searching for your records. Um, so they may ask you about your um, nonprofit status, they may ask you about your fee waiver, if you're asking for a fee waiver. Uh, they may ask you to narrow your request by time or type of record or uh, uh, any number of ways to narrow down what it is you want them to search in their uh, vast government storehouse of information and records. Now, in the back and forth phase, uh, you want to, like I mentioned, uh, communicate promptly. Hopefully, you'll get them into an email conversation. And by the way, don't do what a lot of people do in emails where you, you don't delete all of the previous emails. You want each communication to stand on its own. And one way to uh, minimize the frustrating process that FOIA can become is to be very clear about what you're asking, and by the way, always ask for that estimated completion date uh, in those kinds of letters. But remember, the people that you're initially working with um, are overworked. They have a vast number of requests. They have been schooled to provide you with the records you, they think you're eligible for, but uh, you need to really treat them fairly and 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 directly. And you need to realize that there is a kind of judicial uh, reasonableness here in looking back. And you need to be clear that when your client says, I want all of these records and I want them all now, uh, you need to ask the client, well, look, is this going to stand within, withstand judicial reasonableness? And so all of those men and women out there are 1,300 black robed uh, federal judges they're the ones that determine what is uh, judicially reasonable at the end of all this process. So you want to make sure that it passes the muster of, of, of the judges that you think are in, uh, you know, that you're going to be appearing for. And I always want to think about, well, who are all these judges that are actually eventually going to read this? If the client is asking for too much and they're being unreasonable, then the judge is going to see my case, my Eventually, if it gets to a case, he, he or she is going to see it in a, uh, a bad light. And I always like to have it be really nice, nice and soft and sweet emails. I would like to know my estimated completion date in answer to your question. I do want all emails within the 90-day period that I've stated in my request. And that kind of thing goes a long way with the agency. It also goes a really long way with the judge if it ever gets down, down, down the road. By the way, you've got to save all these written records. And I also counsel my clients that ultimately I need a chronological record of every single communication that they've had. Uh, it goes without saying that if you talk on the phone or your client talks on the phone, they need to follow that up with a letter or an email to have a written record of the latest um, time that uh, is 
where the where the client has shown reasonableness. And I, I've had, I've won cases. Uh, one case I was representing a nonprofit group, and the uh, lawyer for the uh, agency said, "Well, you know, this is really unreasonable. You know, you file this case, and 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 the agency has has really shown that they they were trying to get you these records." And yet you filed a, a federal lawsuit. And I said, well, let me show you the administrative record my client has uh, provided me. And that shows a two-year process of about every two weeks asking for these records. And you never once, your client never once provided an estimated completion date. So it's not clear at this moment in the beginning of this case whether this client really is ever going to get a response. I suspect they'll get one. By the way, that case turned out to be uh, an attorney fee award of, of uh, over $80,000 at the end of that case. So um, it was well worth my effort to uh, get the client the, the records. So after some back and forth and delay, typically an agency will give up some records and then they will issue that final determination letter. And that final determination letter is really important in the process. They're required to give the explanations of why they're not giving you all the records that they found. And they're also uh, required to tell you how to appeal, uh, how to administratively appeal the determination. So, um, for example, I had a client who, who was uh, trying to get records from the uh, CIA, wanted to know about a particular um, uh, CIA uh, official who was her father, and she um, was turned down at the request stage, at, at this stage, the final determination letter, and at the administrative appeal level. But she eventually got records when she filed for the judicial review. Um, one final thing is that determination letter will normally give you a 90-day period, and we'll get into that in a minute. Now, in that um, determination letter, uh, they're going to tell you that they provided records if they did, and they're going to either withhold a record. That's where there's a piece of paper, for example, and they're not giving you that page. Or there's a redaction. That's where they give you a, a letter or a document or an email, but they've taken out information and redacted it. Whether it's a withholding or a redaction, they have to say what exemption, which of the nine statutory exemptions is the reason that they didn't give you that. And then they are required to tell you that you have 90 days, not 90 working days, these are now 90 calendar days, to administratively appeal that. And incidentally, uh, practice tip, sometimes your client will get that letter and it'll be uh, 10 days before they get the letter. Uh, it's dated, and then maybe it goes to their agency mail room, and then maybe it's mailed, and and now it's it's got three or four days to get to you, your client, I mean, and your client gets it, and now they are trying to get an appointment with you, and they come in, and all of a sudden, a 90-day letter is turned into your 60-day deadline. And so uh, keep in mind that it's from the date of the letter, not when you receive it. This is my commentary on examples of final determination letters. So I'm going to go through a few of these uh, letters just to highlight a couple of things. Uh, the first one is uh, the Federal Trade Commission letter. Uh, again, you notice that they hand stamp the date, July 5. That's the date that somebody in the agency stamped it. It's not clear that's the date it was signed. It's not clear that's the date it was mailed. But that's the beginning of your um, of your period uh, to uh, administratively appeal. Um, so a couple of things. One is they say this is the final response. Another thing they say is we're withholding four complaints under exemptions three and five. And they also say, if you don't like this, you can administratively appeal. And they give you the name and address. By the way, the, the, uh, the um, uh, time period on this example is 90 days. 
And at the time, uh, many of these administrative appeal letters are written. They might have 30 days, they might have 60 days, but the statute's been changed, and they're all required to give you 90 days, whether they give it to you or not properly in the letter, you do have 90 days. This is a slide about the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And, and this one I'm, I'm putting in there because it's 2002. And you'll notice in this letter, it says you have to appeal within 30 days. Well, again, the law has been changed. So just keep in mind, it's 90 days. Here's one from 2016, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and they're giving a much more detailed uh, explanation of why they're not giving this uh, requester uh, the, all the contracts that they uh, uh, requested. And so uh, they're giving you all the exemptions. So this uh, concludes by saying your appeal must be received within 60 days. So that's an error. It's now, uh, it's now 90 days. Now, in terms of practical tips for the final determination letter, uh, keep in mind that uh, agencies will often interpret uh, the FOIA exemptions too broadly, and this is where there's a real need for attorneys with some specialized knowledge. Um, and uh, I want to point out that the fee shift provisions of the Freedom of Information Act will compensate uh, attorneys for uh, some successful judicial reviews, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I think it's helpful to talk about what are the exemptions that are most commonly abused. Now, here's a list of the nine statutory exemptions under the Freedom of Information Act. Keep in mind that there is no exemption for something that might be embarrassing. Keep in mind there is no exemption for something that might be controversial. Keep in mind that there is no exemption for uh, we don't want to give this to you. So uh, those are either, uh, uh, you know, used in, in practice or uh, in concept by agencies, but federal courts have been very clear that those are the nine exemptions, and if the agency is not giving you a record, they have to cite a specific one through nine, one of these exemptions. And I'll also mention that at the end, there's a and any reasonable segregable portion of a record. That means they can give you a record, they have to give you a record, uh, but they can redact out portions of a page that might be, say, uh, confidential business information or medical files. Now, just to highlight that segregability uh, provision. Uh, keep in mind that that uh, the agency, uh, by this statute, by this provision in the statute, they really have to give you the record, and then they have the duty to take the part out, uh, make it impossible for you to read the part that is truly protected by the exemption. Let's take a look at uh, the actual uh, five United States Code, Section 552B. That's where we get into all of the exemptions uh, here, uh, and, and you'll hear uh, courts, and you'll read in opinions, courts will talk about Exemption 1, Exemption 2, that type of thing. Well, each exemption has a name that goes with it. So just to look at, at number four, uh, Exemption 4 is trade secrets, often called B4, uh, or trade secrets, um, and, and you see uh, a few of the others. And here are the, uh, the, the bigger ones under seven. That's your law enforcement, seven A, B, C, and D, and E, and F. Uh, so that's been expanded a bit for your uh, review. And then, uh, of course, um, we have uh, financial regulation, number eight, and the very uh, unused exemption nine, which is for geological or geophysical information. I'm gonna really go over a few of the ones that are used most commonly that I've seen in my practice. Um, 
Exemption two, internal personnel practices. Number four, confidential business information. We'll talk about a Supreme Court case that was decided uh, in 2019 on that topic. Very important. Uh, exemption five, the attorney client and deliberative process privilege. Number six, personnel and medical uh, information. And number seven, law enforcement records compiled for law enforcement purposes. So just to uh, look at exemption two quickly, uh, it's the one that that provides the government may uh, not uh, release uh, information or records showing internal personnel practices of a federal agency. Uh, in the Milner case, which went uh, all the way from um, the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Washington, all the way through the Ninth Circuit, and then the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, this case uh, uh, makes it clear that it bars the disclosure of information related solely to the internal personnel rules and practices of an agency. In the Milner case, the Navy uh, used Exemption 2 to deny information about the storage of explosives and maps depicting the effects of hypothetical explosions. So uh, that's an example where uh, sensitive information was deemed to be disclosable under Exemption 2 and the plaintiffs obtained the information. Exemption four is a very important exemption because a lot of businesses and uh, and nonprofit groups want information about business, about specific businesses, uh, and about the economy generally. And so, uh, exemption four protects the uh, and it bars the disclosure of trade secrets and commercial or financial information that is privileged or confidential. This case uh, called the Argus Leader case, Food Marketing Institute v. Argus Leader Media, was decided by the Supreme Court. Again, this is not a constitutional case. Um, uh, this is a statutory case, so the statute can be amended. But the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the uh, Argus Leader, which is a newspaper in South Dakota, could not obtain information uh, uh, from the um, uh, food industry uh, because the information sought was subject to exemption four. And so that's a big case and it really limits uh, confidential business information, but uh, there is more to the story. Keep in mind that although uh, exemption four does uh, limit the disclosure of confidential information. Keep in mind that the um, information is both customarily and actually treated as private and provided to the government under an assurance of privacy, the information is confidential. So a lot of commentators and myself included uh, have pointed out that the information not only has to be customarily and actually treated as private, but there has to be a showing that the information was provided to the government under an assurance of privacy. And so that's where you'll see some cases develop of uh, just how much assurance <laughs> has to be shown and how is it shown, that sort of thing. Another big area is, and this comes up in civil lit litigation as well, is uh, the attorney-client privilege and the deliberative process privilege. And we can all remember back maybe into law school uh, about uh, Hickman versus uh, Taylor and other cases even before the uh, advent of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, but basically uh, uh, documents that are privileged in civil discovery, if they're, if they're documents that are uh, normally privileged in civil discovery context, they're going to be exempt under, under the Freedom of Information Act. Now, in this uh, NLRB versus uh, Sears Roebuck case in 1975, uh, they lay out examples under Exemption 5 of what uh, they want to uh, 
clearly say that's within Exemption 5. And, and of course, that would include the working pages, working papers of the agency attorney and documents that would come within the attorney-client privilege. Uh, but um, withholding papers that uh, reflect the agency's group thinking of working out uh, what the policy should be and determining what the administrative rules should be, uh, that's going to be uh, within that, but it's, um, it's not going to uh, uh, sequester any final opinions or uh, policy and interpretations that have been adopted by the agency. So that's um, an obvious thing that uh, when they do come up with a policy that is public and not properly uh, uh, exempted under, under Exemption 5. Another big one that comes up a lot is the disclosure of personnel and medical files or similar files that would constitute a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. This is the uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1976, cited many times yeah, up until the present day, um, Department of Air Force versus Rose. And keep in mind that uh, high-level officials, uh, such as the secretary of a cabinet uh, agency, uh, they're not going to uh, be able to claim that because it's not a clearly unwarranted invasion of their personal privacy if they're going to be uh, subject to the confirmation process in the U.S. Senate, nominated by the president, uh, commonly in the trade papers, a common of whatever agency they're in. Uh, but what about all the people um, under them? Well, some of them are going to be lower level people. And so Exemption 6 allows the government to X out the name of the uh, person that is arranging a meeting. Uh, maybe they're not uh, paid more than uh, $30,000 a year. And, and why are we invading their personal privacy? So high level people generally cannot get that exemption. And I've won a number of exemption six cases where my client wants to know about the higher level people and where they went. Um, I handled the case of uh, EBAN versus FDA and Ms. Eban, who gave her permission for me to discuss her case, uh, is a journalist with the Fortune magazine in New York. She uh, wrote a book called Bottle of Lies about the generic, uh, generic uh, drug industry. And uh, she was trying to get some information uh, from the FDA. They didn't give it to her. And uh, I represented her, and she got that information. Happy to say her book went on the New York Times bestseller list, and she was kind enough to put something nice in her book uh, about my uh, work. But uh, we weren't asking for uh, low-level personnel information. We were asking for high-level uh, uh, personnel information. And so we, we – um, got that record, got those records for her. Now, in this uh, Department of Air Force versus Rose case, um, they are not going to, uh, and, th and this is why uh, we won that case I just talked about, is that Congress didn't e e expect and, and did not create a blanket exemption. And so, uh, the the back and forth on the um, on 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 this weighing process is that the limitation in the statute is a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy, and that involves a balance between protecting an individual's right to privacy uh, and the preservation of the public's right uh, to government information. So. Oftentimes, you can win an Exemption 6 that the agency has what I would call overreacted. Now, Exemption 7 comes up a lot. I mentioned the FBI is one of the federal agencies that gets the most FOIA requests, but Exemption 7 applies to any law enforcement records held by any agency. So you'll notice that there are agencies that have law enforcement functions that are way beyond the FBI, 
Exemption 7 applies to all uh, law enforcement uh, records. Now, uh, there's several different parts of Exemption 7, 7, 7, A, B, C, D, uh, E, and F. And um, so you're going to have to, again, discern when you get back a, a letter from an agency saying, we're not giving it to you because of uh, of 7D, uh, it, it, we don't want to disclose the identity of confidential sources. So that's an example where they'd probably win uh, on that. But uh, C, that involves a big weighing process. Uh, law enforcement records compiled for law enforcement purposes that could reasonably be expected to constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Uh, keep in mind, a lot of people um, are in the news. They are prominent people. They might be members of Congress. They might be uh, politicians of other sorts. They might be uh, business leaders that have uh, given lots of interviews, and there's going to be no unwarranted invasion of personal privacy regarding their records. So keep in mind, the agency may not know that. They may not know that this person is a CEO and has done uh, 50 television interviews. Um, it's going to be harder for them to claim an exemption uh, 7C in that in that situation. Now, in the um, FBI versus Abramson case, the Supreme Court uh, said that there's going to be a two-part test. One is, was the record compiled for uh, enforcement, law enforcement purposes? Was it really compiled for law enforcement purposes? I've, uh, I've, I've been a part of judicial reviews involving uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They routinely gather information. Was that gathered? Was that compiled for law enforcement purposes? No. So it wouldn't meet. It wouldn't meet the first test of the Abramson uh, decision. But keep in mind, the agency also has to demonstrate that the material that their the records they would be releasing would be one of the six harmful results uh, in. Uh, in Exemption 7, the A through F uh, exemptions under Exemption 7. So that is your um, kind of guidepost of, of how to interpret the records that you see being exempted or being um, redacted under Exemption 7. Now, um, Keep in mind that after you finish, as I previously described, the FOIA process, after you get your uh, records or not, and then you get a uh, letter that's a final determination letter, that's when that 90-day period uh, begins. Uh, it's during this time that you have to challenge the decisions that the agency made uh, in not giving you all the records or not seeking, not, not searching for all the records. Now, um, <laughs> this is something when I first got into FOIA I thought was really uh, ironic, and that is, well, who would be the best arbiter of whether the agency was fairly applying the exemptions or not? And I thought, well, maybe it's the Department of Justice. Maybe there's some federal agency that makes these decisions. But no, Congress said the best people to be uh, really independent, to really be a decider, would be the agency itself. <laughs> And so that's an irony of the process. You are actually appealing to the same agency. Now, typically, as a practical matter, there's a different staff of people, but it is uh, you know, clear that the agency within its process can converse back and forth about your administrative appeal. And it is the agency that you are, that's the first level of appeal you have. The administrative appeal is to the agency. And they must make that decision within 20 days of receipt, 20 working days of their receipt of the uh, decision. And they almost never make the 20-day deadline. And keep in mind, you have the burden as a future plaintiff in a judicial review. You have the burden to show that they received uh, the uh, administrative appeal within the 90 days and when they precisely received it. Now, 
when you have an administrative appeal, when the agency has uh, denied you records either because uh, they didn't look for them or they couldn't find them, the, what I would call an adequate search for records, or because they found the records, but they are not giving them to you or your client. They're not giving them because they illegally invoked one of the nine statutory uh, exemptions. Those are the two issues in every administrative appeal, and you only have to raise them. And I would highly recommend that you always say, my client is appealing because uh, the agency failed to make an an adequate search, and the agency illegally failed to uh, provide uh, your client with the records in violation of one or more of FOIA statutory exemptions. Obviously, the more uh, legal definition you can give it, uh, the more you're likely to, to win. But the bottom line is you have two issues in every administrative appeal. Now, again, as with the receipt of the request, as a practical matter, it is your duty to make sure the agency received the administrative appeal within the, uh, within the 90 days. And again, not 90 days of when the agency signed it, not 90 days of when they mailed it, not 90 days of when your client received it, not 90 days from when your client came in to talk to you about it. No, 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 it's 90 days from the date that the agency said they made the decision. And that means you've got to really monitor that 90-day period, because you might not get it until 45 days have gone by. Um, okay. Now, once you file your administrative appeal, they have to make a decision within 20 working days. And they almost never do that. And again, it's your duty to uh, make sure that you know when they received your administrative appeal. Uh, keep in mind, too, that back to that amendment to FOIA that says because uh, the agencies aren't getting the decisions made and they're not able to or want to respond within the statutory timelines, the uh, search and processing fees are uh, waived or can be waived within uh, uh, that your client won't have to pay because of the delay. And you should be up on that and make sure that you don't pay fees that you're not required to pay. Now, the next process after an administrative appeal has been uh, filed and decided or filed and not decided, but 20 days runs out. The next step is uh, filing the complaint uh, with a, a United States District Court that has the uh, uh, venue to handle it. And eventually, uh, if you don't have a resolution, you're going to have to make a motion for summary judgment. And of course, uh, you have to uh, state that there are no material facts in dispute. Uh, you want to attach your client's administrative record of it. And you have to uh, show that the agency has violated uh, some of the uh, requirements in the in the disclosure. And, and a case called Wheeler v. CIA said that each document that has been requested must have been produced or found to be wholly exempt from the inspection requirement. By the way, uh, just a reference here, you can request to inspect records that a federal agency has, as well as request copies of records, and virtually all FOIA litigation is about uh, producing, having the agency produce copies of records, but in the Wheeler case, I believe it was an actual inspection case where the plaintiff wanted to inspect the records. Um, keep in mind that in a summary judgment proceeding, the agency bears the burden of sustaining its decision on both the adequacy of, of 
its search as well as the exemptions uh, uh, that they're citing. Uh, in other words, in, in a normal civil case where a plaintiff files a, a complaint and a defendant files an answer, in a FOIA case, the next step is the agency has the burden of proof. So the plaintiff in a FOIA case is actually a defendant, if you want to think about it that way. They're, they are not the party with the burden of proof in a FOIA case. It's the defendant by act of Congress. The defendant agency has the uh, burden of proof. Very big advantage to uh, a plaintiff. Uh, one other thing on this slide I'll point out is that courts have to give a substantial weight to the agency's uh, affidavits of what they did to search for records, why they believe those records are uh, properly uh, not produced, and that is a big advantage to the government, that there's a lot of case law saying courts give substantial weight to the agency's um, search and uh, and uh, Vaughn Index uh, discern decisions. I'll talk a little bit about the Vaughn Index later. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, cases are normally decided on a summary judgment motion uh, where the plaintiff says uh, that the search wasn't adequate and I think the uh, records have been uh, improperly redacted or withheld. The agency uh, claims just the opposite. Uh, keep in mind that uh, the agency affidavits, if they describe the justifications for non-disclosure with reasonable detail, and if they uh, demonstrate that it falls logically within an exemption, uh, then they're going to be, uh, the court's going to sustain that. Keep in mind, too, that m many of you listening to this are well aware that discovery under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure are common uh, depositions, requests for admissions, you know, uh, uh, interrogatories. Uh, almost all of that is is rare. I mean, well, all of it's rare, and and it's disfavored. Uh, the the uh, discovery uh, commentary in the in the uh, in the cases I've seen, uh, they they say that discovery would would turn FOIA on its head, and it would be. Um, it would be uh, contrary to the to structure of, of FOIA. So uh, the courts will rarely allow discovery. I, I have talked to people who have had a, a deposition when there's a true battle of experts in the, in the affidavits, but uh, normally, and I would say I'm talking 99% of the time, you're not going to have discovery in a FOIA case. Now, um, in the judicial review phase, that is after your client's made a request, after they've gotten a decision, after they've administratively appealed, now they may have the opportunity then to go for a judicial review in front of an Article III federal judge. Now, the agency uh, may not have issued their final response letter, and it, it's been in limbo way beyond the 20 days that they should have made their decision, uh, that is a reason for you to get into federal court. Another is that you administratively appealed their denial of your, of your request, and, and they didn't decide your, administratively, uh, your administrative appeal within the 20 working days. That'll get you in the judicial review. Or finally, that you made the request, they denied it, and then you administratively appealed, and then they denied that. Now you can go for judicial review. But keep in mind, FOIA is an administrative law, and you must follow these steps uh, very carefully, or you will get thrown out at the judicial review uh, uh, you know, position of the litigation. Now, I've mentioned at the beginning of this uh, discussion that you can bring the action in a district court where the plaintiff lives, where the records are located, or in Washington, D.C. Uh, sometimes there are fights over where the records are located. Uh, there could be, and rarely I've seen, there could be fights over where the plaintiff lives. 
But the bottom line is you'll always be allowed, if you meet the criteria, you'll always be allowed to bring a judicial review in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. And um, sometimes the issue of, well, how long do you have how long do you have to bring a judicial review? And FOIA does not have a, a uh, statute of limitations. And so uh, the Spanaus case in 1987, uh, D.C. Circuit, decided that since FOIA doesn't have a statute of limitations, uh, the court there said, we're going to use the overall uh, civil um statute of limitations, catch-all statute, uh, which I've produced there for you, 28 U.S.C. Uh, section 2401 uh, sub A. And that says it, it shall be barred unless the complaint is filed within six years after the right uh, right of action first accrue. And so... Um, we're not quite sure when that six years begin. Does that begin with the uh, when you file the when you file a request? Probably not because you couldn't go into court when you just file a request. Uh, what about twenty days later? Maybe because if they haven't taken action with that twenty days, you can go to court. Certainly, uh, if they made a final decision and you administratively appealed it, maybe 20 days after that would begin the six-year period. It rarely comes up. Um, and what I usually do, if my client is anywhere close to this six years, I have them file a new and improved and better and streamlined request. Uh, but there is a statute of limitations that's been applied by a circuit court uh, to FOIA. Now, um, I mentioned that I litigate these cases in the D.C. District because I know that the court always has jurisdiction and venue. But in addition to jurisdiction and venue, they also handle maybe half of all the cases in, in the, under the Freedom of Information Act. They're well aware of all of the amendments that are made as this is a moving target. They're well aware of that. And I also think that the uh, federal court there um, uh, is uh, more neutral and they're less influenced by regional or local industries. For example, maybe the timber industry in Oregon or the mining industry in Tennessee or maybe the entertainment industry uh, in uh, Southern California. So um, those are examples where the D.C. district uh, has judges from uh, from a different, lots of different backgrounds, and uh, the, of course, they are uh, as any federal court. They're influenced by the temperament of the uh, judicial attitude of the president to appoint uh, members of their same political party with more or less the judicial outlook that that president wants. Uh, but they're typically uh, all, all able to read the statute very clearly, and they're all generally willing to go along with the intent of Congress. So I, I really think it's – and also I think it's another thing. It's not only the expertise of the judges that handle these cases. It's also the expertise – of the assistant U.S. attorneys that are the ones that are defending all these federal agencies in this very important district court. So now I'm going to give a few uh, practical tips for lawyers that are handling uh, Freedom of Information Act cases. Uh, keep in mind that FOIA is not generally for free, meaning that uh, in addition to paying, you know, the the lawyer that's doing this work, if a lawyer is doing the work, because a lot of people do their own requests, the vast majority are uh, people making their own requests. But keep in mind that the document search and the document review fees can be expensive to your client, and you need to make it clear that although any person can make a FOIA request, uh, the cost of, of processing it can be uh, very high. 
And you want to make sure that you say, or your client says, I'm willing to pay a certain amount of money, uh, but any amount above uh, uh, that amount, and I usually set the number pretty low in a, in a personal FOIA case, I'll, I'll maybe set it at $25. In a, uh, a corporate uh, or business uh, case, I might set it at, at uh, $1,000, although I made a recommendation to a client to set it at 1000 and they said, no. We, we only want to set it at 500 So it really depends on what your client is willing to uh, pay to look for. And that's why it's important to kind of narrow down your requests because you're going to pay less money. Um, on this slide, I've also included a website so you can learn a little bit more about uh, the Freedom of Information Act process for uh, setting up these costs. And uh, I also want to mention something else about the document duplication fee. And, and the, the Congress in 2007 made amendment to uh, the Freedom of Information Act, and they, and they made it clear that if the agency uh, breaches a deadline, then those fees cannot be imposed. And so uh, I'll talk about a case pretty soon on that topic. In uh, the Benzman case, decided by the D.C. District in, in 2011, uh, the amendment said, uh, and, and here's what the district court said in the Benzman versus National Park Service case, to underscore Congress's belief in the importance of the statutory time limit, the 2007 amendments declare that an agency shall not assess search fees if the agency fails to comply with any time limit of FOIA. And so obviously one of the main uh, duties of the agency is to provide the records and make a determination within 20 days. So this is a really important case and a lot of lawyers are not aware of it. Uh, I gave some uh, lectures uh, last year at the University of Tennessee and the University of Georgia uh, law schools and uh, uh, several lawyers came up to me afterwards and said, I, I didn't know about that. So keep in mind that's a really big uh, game changer for some clients who are, who are stymied by the high amount of money that uh, would be uh, needed to get certain records. And keep in mind that is not just for public interest uh, cases, that is also for business cases. Now, um, you can ask for waivers of fees and uh, you can get them if you're a public interest organization. You can get them if you're news media uh, and uh, those kinds of organizations should ask for those waivers. But as I said, the Benzman case somewhat uh, moots some of those uh, kinds of problems, but it definitely uh, you should be asking for those, if, your client should be asking for those if that applies. Um, I also think with regard to public interest requests that your your client uh, should consider media releases about the request because federal agencies will respond quicker if there are uh, if there are public inquiries about it and uh, keep in mind also that your public interest requesters if they are working with media which most public interest groups do uh, those public interest group uh, may be able to get media to ask for records in addition for the records that your clients, your public interest client is asking for records. Now, um, it's hard to estimate how long it takes to get uh, records as we discussed earlier, but here's a couple of uh, graphs showing the, uh, showing the uh, immigration customs uh, enforcement agency uh, and the environmental protection agency, the number of of closings, the number pending, and you can see uh, there's a lot of a lot of FOIA cases out there uh, that are you know going on. Here's a uh, number of of days uh, you know a FOIA requests are uh, pending uh, from the EPA, and it just shows a general growth from uh, December of 2012 all the way up to. Uh, uh, 
December or June, I guess June of 2017. So it shows a growth of roughly 100 to 350, and those are the number of days that the request uh, remained pending. Here's the same graph, only this is the number of days requests remain pending from, um, from Immigration Customs Enforcement. Uh, again, this shows a drop, a pretty substantial drop, and maybe they just had, they were going up so rapidly that Congress uh, gave them the agency or that the agency reprogrammed uh, uh, people in to, to handle those requests. Here's one from the Department of Defense uh, illustrating the uh, difference between a so-called simple request versus a so-called complex request. The term simple and complex are not in the statute. That's something the agency uses in the way they uh, decide how to handle a request. If they label it simple, uh, then it gets a certain amount of energy and staff. And if they label it complex, uh, it, maybe it's going to be a higher level of people in the, agency, in the FOIA office handling it. Uh, this is a slide over the number of pending uh, FOIA lawsuits. And this is, uh, I believe, uh, both uh, district court and circuit court uh, data that the FOIA project put together. Their website, foiaproject.org, and it just shows the uh, rapid growth rate from the uh, 2016. Uh, the the last year of the Obama administration and then the beginning of the uh, Trump administration to show this rather large increase in the number of pending judicial reviews at the district court, mostly at the district court level. Now, uh, there was an interesting article about the uh, attorney fee awards in FOIA litigation and uh, that uh, blue line on the, dra on the, on the graph is the, uh, is the number of FOIA judicial reviews that are pending uh, throughout the federal court system. And again, if you just look at those uh, blue graph lines, you see this steady increase in the number of, of uh, cases, both cases pending as well as cases filed. It points out a need for uh, more lawyers to handle these cases, more judges uh, to process them. So let's talk a little bit about the mother's milk of attorneys, and that is attorney's fees. Now, FOIA will, in some circumstances, force the government to pay the attorneys that help the people that of uh, been denied records and that they get records. And this is a, a good way to get good money for public interest work uh, in the event that you're representing a nonprofit group or a journalist uh, uh, or scientist that is, that is asking for records, not for their own uh, personal value to them, but rather for the common good uh, you're, you're, you're able to get into the framework, the rubric, the, the ball game of getting attorney fees. Um, and uh, incidentally, I mentioned that if you're licensed in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, you can live anywhere and still get paid uh, D.C. attorney fee rates when filing judicial reviews in the D.C. District. That can be a real advantage to people in different parts of the country. Um, I would say in general, private businesses uh, would not be eligible for attorney fees if they have a pecuniary interest in the records, but there are examples of attorney fees that have been awarded to private businesses uh, who have obtained records under FOIA. Uh, the statutory provision is the court may assess uh, against the United States reasonable attorney fees and other litigation costs reasonably incurred. This uh, provision of FOIA has been taken out of uh, the major federal uh, attorney fee shift um, legislation, such as the Civil Rights Act. 
or the Clean Air Act or other of the earlier uh, 1960s, early 70s uh, federal fee shift laws. Um, FOIA, however, does continue that a complainant has substantially prevailed if the complainant obtains relief under either a judicial order or a voluntary or unilateral change in position by the agency if the complainant's claim is not insubstantial. Well, these last two things, the judicial order or the unilateral change, uh, have given rise, of course, to litigation over who actually qualifies. It's common that attorney fees are awarded in FOIA cases, in public interest FOIA cases, where the plaintiff demonstrates the entitlement and eligibility. Keep in mind that the FOIA attorney fee statute does not allow for requests, uh, attorney fees for making requests or for working on administrative appeals. It's only the judicial review process where attorney fees can be uh, awarded. Now, I mentioned there's that two-step process. You have to be eligible, and then you have to show uh, entitlement. And the Brayton case, Brayton v. Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, a D.C. Circuit case, it lays out this language. In order to be eligible, a plaintiff must have substantially prevailed on his FOIA claim. Now, that substantially prevailed generally means, did you get records? Now, you can't just say, oh, they didn't give me an estimated completion date, but their search was good and and all their exemptions were good. I never got any records. Well, that's not going to cut it for substantially prevail. Uh, secondly, you have to show your entitlement to the fees, and the entitlement means a bunch of different factors, including the reasonableness of the government's initial refusal to disclose the information. And uh, I, I just, this is my own opinion, substantially prevailed basically means that the plaintiff received more records than they were, in, uh, that were initially released prior to litigation. This is a bit of a war story called Cornucopia v. AMS. This is one of my cases where uh, the judge uh, uh, quoted uh, the May assessed against the United States reasonable and other litigation costs substantially incurred where the complaint has substantially prevailed. And um, then there's the eligibility prong and uh, ask whether the uh, uh, plaintiff has substantially prevailed. And then they must obtain, they must show that they obtain relief through either judicial order or voluntary or unilateral change in position. And in this case, the, the court uh, found that, that no records were produced at the request phase or at the administrative appeal phase. Uh, as soon as the case was filed in the district court, um, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of records showed up. And then when we started fighting over the attorney fees, uh, they said, well, you know, uh, they haven't substantially prevailed. Well, um, in this case, I was able to show that uh, I was able to get more records than were initially released after the filing of the judicial review. And that helped the court uh, come to the conclusion that, um, that the plaintiff did substantially prevail, and therefore uh, the plaintiff met the criteria for the eligibility prong and attorney fees uh, were awarded in that case. Keep in mind that the uh, entitlement uh, prong is a variety of factors and is not the de sole determination of, of whether they're going to get the fees or not. In terms of entitlement, then, there are lots of different factors. None of them are, no one of them is dispositive, but uh, generally you're going to have to show public benefit. Did these records uh, get out into the public? You're going to have to show that there was not much, if any, commercial benefit to the requester. You're going to have to show that the requester's interest was high and that it was uh, public and it was um, 
beneficial to someone other than the requester. And last but not least, you're going to have to show the unreasonableness of the agency's conduct. That's why you want to have these uh, reminder letters, these requests for estimated completion dates. These, uh, You said you would send me these records in 30 days, and I'm writing you in 35 days, and am I going to get my records? These are uh, the kind of things that you can use factually to show uh, all these factors. And, um, and, and it's a way to win these cases. Now, um, there are cases where uh, businesses have won attorney fees. And I don't want to paint a picture here that that is routine. It's really not. Uh, in fact, the Fenster versus Brown case, D.C. Circuit, 1979, pretty much says there uh, will seldom be an award of attorney fees when the suit is to advance the private commercial interest of the complainant. Now, the uh, district court in Washington, D.C. in 1992 was presented with a case in which a private party, a business, was suing to get records. And they eventually got the records and the government argued they shouldn't get uh, attorney fees because they're, they, they were motivated by commercial interest. Uh, well, uh, the, the um, court did find that although FOIA was fundamentally designed to inform the public and not benefit private litigants, when a litigant seeks disclosure for a commercial benefit, uh, or out of personal motives, an award of attorney fees is generally inappropriate. But in this case, uh, they found that the private entity really was uh, putting out information to the public. Their business was to put out information for IRS tax analysts, hence the name of the company, tax analysts. And um, in that case, they did award attorney fees. I'll just comment that uh, uh, one big one that a lot of reporters have asked me about when they've heard that attorney fees aren't awarded and they don't know whether they could get an attorney to handle a case on a fee shift basis. Uh, I point them to the to the tax analyst case because uh, one of the quotes in that case is, news interests should not be considered commercial interests. A court would generally award attorney fees if the complainant's interest in the information was journalistic. And so that is a case that basically says, yeah, uh, Fox News and CNN and USA Today and the New York Times, they, they are certainly businesses that try to make money, but they are typically given the fee waiver uh, in requesting the records, and they're typically given the attorney fee awards uh, when they when they meet the requirements of the attorney fee uh, shift law. Now, um, I'll kind of summarize this by saying it's basically difficult to get attorney fees for most businesses, and here's a couple of cases that uh, say that. Now, how do we figure out what is a uh, reasonable attorney fee? Well, uh, there's a lot of fighting over that, as you might imagine. Uh, anytime you get lawyers fighting over money, you're probably going to have a fight. So um, the bottom line for this is what's called the load star, and that's the reasonable amount of time that was worked by the various categories of the legal workers on the case at the time they worked on it and the reasonable rates at the time they worked on it for doing the work. So you have both a reasonable time concept and you have a reasonable rate concept. So this is a very common thing in federal uh, attorney fee shift litigation. Uh, the guidance from all this comes from the Blum versus Stenson case. It's not a FOIA case, it's a civil rights case. And they uh, give that quote, 
Uh, it's uh, rounding in rates prevailing in the community for similar services by lawyers of reasonably comparable skill, experience, and reputation. I would say that would be rounded out also in a practical way because it's not just your time as the lawyer on the case. It's also your law clerk. It's also your uh, legal assistant because there are reasonable rates for law clerks and lawyers of different skill levels uh, and different experience levels. And those rates change over time. So you have to keep track of not only the time they worked, so then you can determine whether it was reasonable or not, but you also have to know what was the hourly rate at the time the work was done. Again, back to the basics here, the Lodestar, Hensley versus Eckerhart, 1983, U.S. Supreme Court case. Uh, again, the reasonable starting point to determine a reasonable fee is the number of hours reasonably expended multiply it by a reasonable hourly rate. Um, the, the party seeking the award should submit evidence supporting the hours worked and the rates claimed. And uh, they're also saying where the documentation of the hours is inadequate, the district court may reduce the award. So keep track of your time and keep track of it very, very carefully. And the same thing, again, back to the um, Blum v. Stenson, the rates are going to be calculated the same way, whether the plaintiff is represented by a private or nonprofit counsel. Now, in the uh, D.C. District and D.C. Circuit, uh, they've, they've given them such more information on how to establish the entitlement and the reasonableness of the rates uh, in the uh, in the in the civil rights cases that you see here, um, Covington v. District of Columbia. Um, but one of the things that they've used is a matrix that shows the hourly out, hourly price tag uh, for comparable lawyers, and it may provide a useful starting point in calculating market rates. Um, in the DLVDC case there at the bottom of the slide, that was not a civil rights case. It was not a FOIA case. It was a case under the um, laws that provide for individual education um, assistance and plans, and that's why it's called DL versus DC. It's, it's a class action case, and, and they said, we don't like the District, uh, uh, district of Columbia's uh, matrix. We don't like the matrix that the DC court is using. We want a, a higher rates because of the complexity of our, of our case. So, um, this uh, additional evidence besides the the matrix, which I'll show you a few a uh, couple of these matrices, so you can look at them. But basically, you can update that matrix with surveys if you have them. You can update it with uh, affidavits uh, reciting the precise fees that attorneys with similar qualification have received from fee paying clients. You can uh, you can um, uh, include uh, the prevailing market rate and, and of what you believe the market rate is. And uh, you can also show evidence of recent fees awarded by courts. Um, that's all part of the decision making in the, in the, if you take it to a judicial decision. Now, um, I'm more familiar with the D.C. District, but uh, I believe that it's helpful to have a, an expert look over your records and look over what you're asking for, both in terms of rate and reasonableness of time, and have that expert look it all over and, and state that the work is reasonable. Uh, I did that in a case that I concluded in 2018, but the court said, uh, 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 as, as judges will often do, I'll be the judge of that. And the judge said that the cost of that expert attorney was not recoverable under the uh, FOIA statute. Uh, I felt it was well worth it. And I would say as a practical matter, I would do it again, even if, if the uh, fees weren't awarded, uh, because uh, it made my application uh, that much more reasonable that he, the consulting expert attorney, 
uh, cut some of my time, made suggestions on time to be cut to show reasonableness. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these fee uh, matrices and uh, uh, so that you'll get a flavor for how important this is as a practical matter of which a matrix is, is chosen by either the court or for purposes of, of, uh, of settlement discussions. The highest level uh, matrix that I've found is what so-called LSI Laffey matrix. And this is uh, an economist named Dr. Michael Cavanaugh. He's a retired uh, professor that lives in Volcano, Hawaii. And despite that very uh, rural and isolated location, he's become an expert on attorney fees uh, and specifically attorney fees in the uh, District of Columbia District Court. And you can see his matrix is the, uh, uh, the number of years out of law school uh, and the year of his uh, computation. So, for example, uh, we're going to take a look at a few of these comparisons, but you can see the, uh, the 8 to 10 year attorney according to his matrix that goes until uh, May 31, 2020 is, is uh, $661 per hour. Uh, keep in mind that the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia, uh, they put, publish an update for attorneys to use, and they uh, call this the USAO matrix, and that's the one I usually use. The U.S. Uh, AO attorney's fee matrix that I'm showing you for 2015 to 2020, it shows uh, for those uh, five years, it shows the level of, of fees by year. And this is very helpful when you're putting together a multi-year uh, attorney fee uh, petition uh, because you see you have the uh, law clerks and paralegals down there at the bottom with their rates. And then way up at the top, you have the uh, older, uh, more experienced lawyers. And uh, so, so that matrix is one that the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, believes is accurate, and they uh, revised their methodology in, in 2015 to reflect their, uh, their survey that they did at that time. So now we're going to compare this uh, USAO matrix with the LSI Laffey matrix, and we're going to kind of do two comparisons here. We're going to do the 21-year attorney and the five-year attorney. So on the top, uh, we're, we've got a circle there on around $899, and that's the LSI Laffey matrix. It has not been approved by the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office uh, and was approved in the DL versus D.C. case. But keep in mind the USAO matrix for lawyers of that experience is uh, $595 an hour, quite a, quite a bit of difference. Similarly, on the bottom half of this slide, we're showing you the hourly rate of FOIA attorneys with the five years experience. And uh, uh, according to the current matrix, um, that's $458 for the uh, four to seven year attorney and uh, under the uh, USAO matrix, it's $365 per hour under the USAO matrix. So I like to keep my uh, requests for settlement in the ballpark of these uh, numbers and also make sure that my, my time has been reported reasonably. Uh, by the way, at the bottom of the USAO matrix uh, is a big footnote, and I show that in, with blue at the bottom right-hand corner of that slide, and I'll blow it up here. This uh, footnote says that they are working with parties to develop a revised rate schedule, and uh, they're citing the... Uh, the uh, case of DL versus District of Columbia, uh, that case uh, was was not uh, in the favor of the government. It was in the favor of the plaintiffs. 
and uh, it's the one that adopted the uh, LSI matrix that, that I mentioned in earlier that Dr. Kavanaugh was their expert witness on. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that this is an ongoing thing and uh, could be a, a big ticket change uh, down the road. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't want to count on it. Wouldn't count my chickens before they're hatched. But uh, it looks like a positive uh, move. Keep in mind that uh, if, if those of you are thinking, "Wow, those rates look pretty good in that DL versus DC case," uh, it uh, was a 15-year-long case. It was a class action lawsuit. Uh, it was an extensive motion, two trials. 130-page uh, district court opinion, uh, and both parties agreed it was, quote, complex federal litigation. I don't think you can say that about uh, an average FOIA case. So uh, more recently in Barton v. Uh, United States Geological Survey, uh, the court uh, looked at the uh, rates uh, advanced by the plaintiffs, namely the DL versus uh, DC rates that uh, Dr. Kavanaugh testified on. And uh, they said, no, you're not going to get the, uh, you're not going to get the higher rates because uh, this case was a straightforward FOIA case. Only three plaintiffs. I think there were two federal defendants um, and uh, it was narrow, narrow set of issues. And uh, the court, the district court uh, concluded plaintiff's evidence is insufficient to establish that FOIA practitioners in Washington, D.C. receive rates in line with the LSI matrix for complex federal litigation. So I, I think uh, that's the first uh, salvo where the DL case is not going to be applied in an ordinary FOIA case. Now, um, I do think that there is some discussion among plaintiff's lawyers that do FOIA litigation, and I'll, I'll just say that there are points in FOIA litigation where it could be complex. And so the idea of asking for um, the LSI higher uh, rates uh, for the part, the part of the uh, uh, of case that's complex, I think maybe there. Also, there's some hope in the language of the D.C. Circuit that said, as time passes, the Laffey matrix may well, like shoulder pads, eight tracks, and other 80s fads before it uh, may be losing its shine. And so, to me, um, to me, it, it could mean that the uh, USAO matrix is is going by the boards, but uh, we'll have to see some real decisions because so far I haven't found any uh, FOIA case that has invoked and successfully gotten the uh, the higher uh, the higher rates. As with everything else, uh, most attorney fees are resolved with negotiation, and uh, I, I have a couple of uh, practice tips. Keep accurate records of the work you're doing, and by the way, make sure everybody working with you is keeping accurate records of the work that they are performing, because you want to make sure you include all of your um, legal assistants and law clerks that are helping you. Um, you want to make sure that you keep these records on a database, and I say that because you can enter in the at least the USAO matrix rates as you're going along so that you have uh, a, a better idea of what your attorney fee request is going to be toward the, toward the end. I also think you want to be really careful of how you use descriptive words. And by the way, these, this, this advice I'm uh, putting out there or tips that I'm putting out there is really uh, for any kind of uh, fee shift litigation. Um, you want to have uh, 
very clear ideas of what you're doing so that the people reading it, uh, whether it's the U.S. attorney or the agency or a judge or judge's law clerk, uh, they can really see what you're doing. I gave some examples here, drafting complaint, emailed opposing counsel regarding suggestions for the upcoming joint status report, email client to request information on their public interest activities for assistance in drafting plaintiff's affidavit. You take the time to write down what you're doing because if you don't take the time to write a clear record of what you're doing, you can hardly expect that people uh, are gonna pay for it. You know, uh, one of the practice tips I would give you is uh, words like strategizing are really bad words. Uh, you want to make sure that if you're going to strategize, um, that you do that off the clock or you come up with other ways to describe what you're doing. And similarly, uh, I would highly recommend that you limit the amount of time that you're talking about the case as opposed to working on the case within your law firm or within the group of lawyers that are working on the case. I really think that the solo lawyer has a better chance of uh, working on and, and getting the fees. And if they have to occasionally bring in another lawyer, like I did on the attorney fee reasonableness question, uh, fine, bring them in if you need to, but um, keep doing most of the work yourself and the judge will see that you're uh, being uh, diligent to keep the cost down. Um, also think when you're doing your fee petition or you're doing your settlement letter, you want to break it down into the phases of the case. You know, the phases you write the complaint, you work on getting ready to work up to the summary judgment, then you make a motion for summary judgment, you defend against their motion for summary judgment. So make it easy for the opposing counsel and federal agency to understand what you did. And of course, always use the lodestar method to determine what you're asking for. Don't forget that a FOIA is not just an attorney fee law, it's also a cost of litigation statute. And so if you do have expenses like filing fees and postage to serve the defendant, um, keep in mind that you want to make sure you put those in as well. Um, I usually include a discount. Uh, in a specific date where my settlement proposal expires. If it's a big, long, uh, multi-year case, I give them a lot more time to review it. If it's kind of shorter, I give them a shorter time. But I, I do say that, you know, this offer uh, expires at 12 noon on such and such a date. So it's clear that, that I've had to do more work after that. Um, and I don't want to settle for... Uh, an amount after I've had to do even more work. Uh, keep in mind that uh, you should settle most of your fee disputes. I have done that. But keep in mind that if you do get unreasonable uh, responses, then uh, I would say consider go, going distance uh, and uh, showing the judge the work you've done and the reasonableness of the rates you're seeking. Uh, I wanted to mention that I uh, settled a, uh, I, I did not settle a case in 2018 when I consistently received settlement offers that were 50% uh, what I thought my lodestar was. And uh, I didn't settle the case. And uh, I was forced to go through the fee litigation, but uh, the judge ended up making uh, a reasonable uh, fee award, and so I, I, I don't think you should always be forced into taking unreasonably uh, settlement, low settlement offers. And by the way, that hurts a lot of other plaintiffs when you take a low settlement offer if it's unreasonably low. This presentation's been a lot of fun for me to put together, and I hope you've learned something from it. And I just want to thank several people, uh, Robert Mazel, who's executive director of the Center for uh, Center of Continuing Education. I'd like to also thank uh, Colin Farnsworth, 
who's my uh, law clerk and helped me uh, with this presentation. And feel free to call me uh, or consult my uh, website and uh, I'd be happy to talk with you and thanks so much.